Welcome everybody to our third session of our uh, discussion on making change through nonviolent action. Uh, we're looking at the Dandelion Insurrection, uh, Love and Revolution, a book by Rivera Sun. And uh, we're still got a, kind of a minute till start time, but I'm, I'm pleased that you're finding us and you're joining in. And today we're excited because we have a special guest. Rivera Sun is with us. And we're going to get a chance to get to know her a little bit and maybe even hear about her, her next book, The Billionaire Buddha, and learn more about that. Um, I know it's uh, early in California, so I'm appreciating R Rivera for getting up, getting, getting going on this beautiful spring day here in, in Michigan. It's a really nice day. Um, let me show you what the, the agenda I have in mind. I want to mention the our escrow project, the East Side Conflict Resolution Outreach Project, escrow.us, is pleased to be thinking creatively about ways we can involve the community, ways we can uh, do education and training and outreach and direct service. Um, and escrow is a project of the Masters of Arts and Dispute Resolution Program at Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, so uh, they provided some copies of the books for people who uh, were interested in. Uh, reading and joining in with us and kind of expanding the boundaries of the classroom into the community. So those of you who are doing that with us, we really appreciate you joining us. So let me show you kind of where we're going with our the agenda. A couple of housekeeping details. I, uh, there are folks who are joining us audio only, and I'm glad that you're with us. You won't be able to see the slides, so we'll try to describe what's on them. I'm not always good about that but we will make them available uh, after. I've actually posted them at the book, the initial link about the book, the Nonviolent Book Club link, uh, so you can follow along there. The session is being recorded, and uh, there's a process of muting and unmuting yourself. You can mute your video or mute your audio, uh, and I can mute everybody or I can unmute folks. Um, I'm gonna leave it so that you can unmute yourself so uh, that you know, we can kind of try to just do this cooperatively. There is a function called raising your hand, which when we get a list of video feeds going, it's longer than the, what fits on the screen, you drop below the, the, the fold, so to speak. If you raise your hand, it brings you up so I can see you and, and call on you. So that's a useful thing. You'll, you'll, it, it appears different places in your interface, but if you can figure it out, oh, Craig Parton has raised his hand. He's demonstrating the process. Uh, and there's also text chat, which can be useful if you want to communicate, uh, but you're not doing it in the audio. Uh, looks like Dwight has joined us. Most excellent. And I, I did mention the slides already. So here's the agenda. Somebody's marking on the screen, finding their tools for creativity here. Um, so here's the plan I have for today. We'll do an introductory go round. Uh, and then we're going to meet author Rivera Sun. We'll do a, a storyline review and character update. I'm going to ask you about any significant quotes or memorable moments from the final third of the book. Uh, and we'll do our nonviolence nuggets of knowledge section. Um, we're looking at the uh, today movements, campaigns, and actions, thinking about the, what a strategic campaign looks like and how it has different components. I want to talk a little bit about pragmatic versus ideological nonviolence. Some people are, uh, have a spiritual base, others are just pragmatists. And I want to talk about something that's happening live right now, Democracy Spring 2016. And then we'll have a, a go around, a closing thoughts go around where we'll, I'll be asking you about evidence of people power in your lives. So that's kind of the, the plan for today. I'm hoping uh, it's going to be fun and interesting for you, and I'm glad you're with us. Um, so uh, I'd like to do a check-in, and uh, I'm going to go down the list, and it looks like I've got a couple of phone numbers. I'm asking people to tell us your name, your location, where you're, where you're coming in from, and any affiliations you have, and then something you like about spring. I'm really feeling the spring right now. I see a 248-514-0877 phone number. Could you check in for us? Yeah, hi, this is Shahar. Hi, Shahar. I'm in, I'm a, 
Hi. You can hear you. So. Um, I'm calling in from Detroit, and something that I love about spring is the beautiful, beautiful sun coming out from hibernation. Excellent. Thank you. I see 586-219-2334. You can check in for Hi, us. that's Susan Doherty. Hi, I'm Susan Doherty. I am in Warren, Michigan right now, um, and I have some other obligations that I need to get to this afternoon, so I'm doing this audio only. Um, but the thing that I love about spring is the smells. <laughs> the smells of spring. Okay. Thanks. Craig Barton, I see you're up next. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Craig Barton. I'm located in uh, Rochester Hills, Michigan, uh, which is a northern suburb um, of Detroit area. And affiliations. Uh, I'm in the graduate program uh, pursuing a graduate certificate certificate in dispute resolution something i like about spring uh watching the in michigan watching things grow in terms of the buds coming out on trees and flowers and we can look out our windows and see some of that uh in our subdivision uh, mainly at our place uh so i really love that thank you thank you craig uh it looks like david gillis would be up next Can you hear me? I can hear you, David. Okay. Uh, David Gillis. I'm from uh, St. Clair, Michigan, not to be confused with St. Clair Shores. Uh, I am affiliated with the Resolution Center in Mount Clemens. And for the last four years, I've been involved in restorative practices at New Haven High School. About spring, there's probably a lot of things I enjoy about spring, but I would, did want to share with you this morning. I saw one lone dandelion in my lawn uh, today, and I just want to share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> Dandelion Spring. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so I see somebody who's Kajak Cam. I wonder who that might be. Can you check in? Kajak. I wonder who that is. Uh, Daniela, do you want to say how do you do? Yes. Tell us your name, your location, and something you like about spring. Uh, yeah, so my name is Daniela. Uh, I am a student in the master's degree for dispute resolution. And um, I'm talking from Sterling Heights. I'm in a Starbucks right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few folks there at coffee shops. Yes. Thank you for joining. What do you like about spring? Uh, about spring, I love the... Uh, um, the, the sun, the good weather, the fact that uh, I'm going out often and I'm enjoying, I, I, I'm enjoying like staying out more. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Denise. Hey, Denise. Can you check in? Yep. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, Denise Vasellio. I'm in Commerce Township and um, I'm in the Graduate Certificate dispute resolution program love you and your shirt pardon your shirt is beautiful oh thank you well i was going to say the thing i like about spring is running on the trails um near my house and that's why i look the way i look <laughs> <laughs> all right just got done with that <laughs> glad you're with us thanks uh dwight hi uh am i coming through you're coming through okay dwight levins uh located in detroit uh I do dispute or um, conflict or uh, re restorative justice uh, conflict resolution type of things, truancy mediation, and the spring. What I admire most about the spring is the sun is out shining. The trees are hopefully getting ready to bud. I got flowers coming up in my yard, and I got neighbors' kids outside playing. So that's <laughs> good. Thank you, Dwight. Good to have you, Eloise. Eloise, can you check in? I think she dropped out. Uh, Harriet. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, cool. I'm um, at my uh, home in uh, Dearborn, um, affiliated with uh, Birmingham Friends Meeting, a Quaker. I'm interested in conflict resolution. 
and uh, I'm really happy to be digging in the dirt. I like my garden in the spring. <laughs> Thank you. There's no butterflies yet. No, I, I have two chrysalises that wintered over, but wow. hopefully they'll, they'll wait until May at least before coming out. All right. Thank you for joining us. Eloise, do you want to try checking in? You're, I'm, not, I'm hearing just a little bit from you, not, not clear. Let's go to Jackie. Hey, Jackie. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm in the Mater program. Two more weeks to go. <laughs> That's what you like about spring. Is it's, That's it's what I like about spring. But no, I like um, to see the flowers bloom. I like um, to see people, uh, the activity in the streets. It's like there's life. So it's exciting for me. Excellent. Okay, Lindsay, looks like you're up. Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm at a Starbucks, so there's a lot of background sound. Um, I'm with the Mater program, and uh, I live in Detroit, and I love spring because I can take my daughter outside morning, noon, and evening, and it's warm. <laughs> How old is your daughter? She's 15 months old, so she loves getting in the dirt. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Glad you're with us. Thank you. Tommy. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Tommy Martin. I'm in the uh, Mater program, and uh, I'm located in Oak Park, Michigan. And I uh, enjoy the spring because I get to spend more time outside opposed to inside. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're going to move on and and uh, hear from Rivera. Rivera, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I know a few things about you, but maybe you want to go ahead and tell us about yourself. Sure. Um, I am a novelist first, an author of three novels at this point, and I live in Taos, New Mexico, although I'm from Maine originally, so many generations of Maine family members. And Are you Acadian? No, I'm not Acadian. Uh, my family moved to the St. John Valley when I was um, 13, so we're imports to that area. We're, we're more long-lasting along the coastline, which is a beautiful part of Maine. The St. John Valley is very beautiful, too. I remember harvesting, well, I went to a bakery that harvested seaweed in Maine as one of their ways of making money. Yeah, it's a big deal, seaweed harvesting. So uh, my sister-in-law, so to speak, is a seaweed farming researcher. <laughs> wow. My nephew wants to be a, a seaweed farmer when he grows up. He's 10. I guess he likes to swim, I hope. It's cold, cold up there, though. Good swimmer, that's for sure. <laughs> it's like a survival skill. So you're not in Taos right now. You're somewhere else. Where are you? I am in Marin County in California. And uh, I'm actually going to go right from this call to teaching a strategy for action workshop at the Social Justice Center of Marin. So it's kind of a, a very beautiful full day. And they're calling it the Dandelion Skills Workshop. Excellent. Yeah, we're going to go pass on skills for, you know, dandelions. Uh, well, we're glad to have you uh, as you're getting warmed up for the day. We're really pleased you're with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the, the storyline. People have just finished reading on Insurrection, the, the last third of the book. So I thought maybe we would get into a review of the story, come back and have more, more discussion with you. Is there something you like about spring that you could share with us? I like dandelions that come up. <laughs> I also like how people all over the planet unfold like flowers in the spring, that they too come out of their hibernation inward phase and unfold into the world. Excellent. Thank you so much. You see this picture here. Do you want to tell us, it uh, looks like I, I took this, uh, cropped it from the Food Not Bombs. You're with the director or the founder of Food Not Bomb. Mm -hmm. Remember where this was? Yeah, that's in Taos, New Mexico. Keith actually lives 
about five miles down the road from where I do and has a farm and a free school out there and every Saturday goes down and well when he's in town he also he's by local at the moment and is in Santa Cruz California um, and so I went down and helped out and hung out and that's just us that's Keith's beard you can kind of see <laughs> yeah. I cropped him out because he wasn't the star today so. he's a great speaker too he's very entertaining lots of stories well, I guess food is an important issue when it comes to local local you know, awareness and local connections. Food is an important thing. Uh, local food is big in Detroit. Yeah. So, so glad to have you. Glad to Let's be go here. ahead and review where we are in the storyline. Uh, this is kind of tricky for me. I've been, been trying to do these little short uh, announcements of kind of where we're going. We've reached uh, uh, Chapter 23, A Cream and Sugar Woman. And Vallier, uh, who's like an elder statesman, elder in the community, is advising us to learn how to drink our coffee black, preparing for leaner times. He, you know, you should be able to have bitter coffee because you might not have cream and sugar. But Charlie feels like Zadie is the cream and sugar in his coffee. She brings the zest and the, the zip and the, the, the goodness and uh, he feels like uh, he doesn't want to settle for, for bitter coffee. He wants love, and he wants the, the, full, the full mocha. Uh, uh, in absentia, we have a, a shocking development comes along where Charlie and Zadie, they get back together. Zadie's been on the road, and she's been organizing. Uh, they're very weary, but they learn that uh, while they're famous overseas, the French people and, and the the different journals off overseas are they're kind of like folk heroes, but in the United States they're going to be tried for treason in absentia in the U.S. There's going to be this special kind of court that was set up, kind of a military tribunal, terrorism court, not your typical court, is going to be trying them. So uh, kind of some shocking news that they're not going to get a chance to speak up. Uh, they get introduced to a southpaw curveball pitcher. This chapter is about Tansy Bolial, Bolil, a civil rights lawyer with attitude and charm. She's going to represent Charlie and Zadie at the trial, and they may actually appear in person. They're beginning to strategize about that idea. Uh, so the conundrum, the problem, how to keep our dynamic duo safe during their trip to and time at the trial of the century. Uh, there seems to be this idea that because they've become such a focal point for organizing, they might actually be in danger. There's been uh, assassination uh, threats. Uh, so Revolutions is a very short chapter. Uh, Mom, Ellen Bird, is riding her tractor. Sometimes mom power is what is needed. Fed up, Ellen Bird gets off her tractor and jump starts the movement. She calls for a march to Washington. She says, I'm going to go support my, my kids. Uh, so they give it a name, the March of the Gray Riders. So we have uh, uh, Ellen Bird Gray and Charlie Ryder, the Gray Riders. From the north, from the west, and from the south, the people are headed to Washington, D.C. with justice on their minds. Kind of like today with Democracy Spring in D.C. We're going to say more about that. So uh, chapter 29 is about the trial. We get introduced to Judge Samuel J. Bowker. He's going to preside over the trial. While outside, there's the insurrectionists, as they're called, the dandelion movement folks. Cops and soldiers are attempting to preside over the courthouse steps. A lot of struggle over control. Uh, uh, trying to, the marchers are trying to get into D.C., and they're, they're having to go through uh, some tough, tough situations to get there. The Grand Menage, uh, the Mamers uh, say, no work, no play, no school, no shopping. Nothing but le Grand Menage until everything is swept clean. Spring cleaning time. Rivera, can you tell us about uh, le Grand Menage? What is that concept? Yeah, so le Grand Menage is a real thing that happens in Northern Maine every year. Uh, also in Canada, in the French parts of Canada, 
where they literally scrub the house from top to bottom. Um, they even like wash the shutters of the windows and they'll take down all the curtains and wash all the curtains. It's basically spring cleaning, um, but it's like spring cleaning on steroids compared to what my family ever did. <laughs> They will literally, the men go out and scrub the sides of the houses with mops and buckets and things like that. So that's what the historic uh, drama is. It's a real thing. Yeah. Excellent. So chapter 31, uh, in the history of the universe, another short chapter, acts of love and courage are not wasted. Generations of life-loving, justice-seeking, truth-telling peacemakers have drawn strength from those who came before them. The idea of history marching on is very important. Uh, Judgment Day, Chapter 32. People have massed on the D.C. Mall. The jury must deliver a verdict today. Corrupt politicians are scampering toward the airports. Weapons are hot and uncertainty abounds. When we get to the final chapter, the immortal song. Not guilty. Spoiler. Uh, the jury rules in favor of uh, uh, not treating Zadie and Charlie like terrorists, but perhaps not free just yet because drones are loaded with weaponry, are taking aim over the masses. Uh, fortunately, a song breaks free, both old and new, touching the crowd. We shall overcome someday. So there's this moment where there's this mass of people on the mall and they start singing together. So that's the, the storyline we've gotten to. Uh, there's a, um, we did character recognition last week where we talked about the different characters and how we can relate to them. There's a couple new ones. Uh, you, you remember these, the, the parents, uh, Bill Gray and Ellen Gray, Charlie Ryder, uh, Zadie, Aubrey Renault, the chef, Inez Hernandez, the church-based activists, Lupe Hernandez Booker and her husband Todd, suburban renaissance, uh, Rudy, the small-town anti-fracking activist, the cyber monk. Uh, we've added a couple characters. The most dramatic one, of course, is Tansy Belial, Belial short, funny, and tough, a softball, curveball pitcher of a lawyer. And the other one we meet, which we don't get to know too much about, is Samuel Bowker, gun-loving conservative judge presiding over the trial. He loves his guns, and he's worried about uh, issues related to uh, following the Constitution for protecting his right to go hunting on his, his grounds, but it may also turn out to be common ground with folks who are concerned about other constitutional rights. So we have a lot of interesting characters that people can relate to. I'm looking for folks to chime in on some of their favorite moments. Watch this animation here. So I'm looking for folks that might have some thoughts on uh, your favorite moments, what parts of the story uh, you're relating to most, any favorite quotes. I pulled a few quotes uh, that I can share if, if people don't have them, but I'm hoping we might get some, get some shares. Uh, go ahead, Craig. You'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Gotcha. Okay, well, the quote I'd like to share comes uh, right out of chapter 23 on page 260. And in reading the entire story, I think this is probably one that resonated with me the most, um, well, most is maybe is inappropriate, but resonated with me. Uh, and it goes like this. We, Charlie realized, it is always we who are ultimately culpable. He thought about the, sub, the subtle shift that was occurring. Thousands of people had recognized their complicity in destruction. And now we're taking a stand for life. Ah, Charlie thought, when we stop blaming them, and take responsibility for our actions, when we consciously withdraw our cooperation from injustice, that is when real change begins to occur. Not far from the top and not just from the bottom, but from all sides at once, as every person wakes up and makes a conscious choice to preserve the goodness of life on this earth. Nice. So what, what, what do you like about it? 
Well, it resonates with me. In fact, I just wrote down, I was laughing at myself, it's Craig, a, a graying, nonviolent peacemaker with a pacemaker. Uh, it resonates with, with me as a senior citizen uh, who um, has strong, strong concerns about what seems to be occurring in our country and strong desire for equitable and quality of life for, of course, all of my family and grandchildren, but for others as well. So this really resonates with me because the opposite of that is when we start um, categorizing and labeling them and they as the enemy or the um, energy against whatever we're up to. So to me, that's a powerful distinction in my life when I made that shift from they to, hey, I'm part of this too, and have an accountability to myself. Great. Nice one, Craig. Thank you so much. Uh, Dwight. Um, can, I, oh, can I comment on that one as well? This is Shahar. Go ahead, Shahar. Um, I just thought that that quote was very powerful as well. I think it's something that is coming up a lot in um, <clears throat> just different movements that have started occurring is this idea that we all need to take responsibility for what's happening and you do need to make that social, or I'm sorry, that uh, conscious decision to do or not do something. And I think it's something, I think that the quote was so powerful because it really, it reflects um, things that are happening now as well in our current lives, in our current political lives, in our current social lives. So I just wanted to add that I thought that that quote was very good as well. <clears throat> so when you say we need to make a conscious decision, how is that different from other, other ways of acting? Um, I think it's different because, you know, sometimes you just do things because it's what you're expected to to do or it's because, or because you think that it's just what needs, I, not, I don't know. Um, so maybe peer I guess, pressure. Yeah, there's this idea that sometimes you do things because you feel that it's, it's what you're expected, it's what's expected of you rather than because you think that it's the right thing to do. And making that conscious decision to do or not do something can go against those expectations, but actually be the right thing to be doing at the time. So you're more conscious of making the choice and you're more deliberate in your actions because maybe you're going against the tide sometimes. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it looks like Dwight was uh, going to chime in. Dwight, what are you thinking about? You have to unmute. Well, I'll do it. I'll unmute you. Okay. Go ahead. I wanted to comment on the quote as well. Um, I oftentimes think about the they. We're always looking at those other people. But I, I remember very well how complicit so many of us are in what's going on. For example, like right now, we have real problems with the corporate uh, industry and how, or for example, Ford's is moving, uh, building a plant in Mexico, et cetera. Well, all of us who have retirement funds, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, we invest our money in those through our retirements or directly, and we expect a good return from that. And we don't ever question how that return came about. Mm. That puts us right in there with them. Actually. So we might not be claiming it, but we're, we're part of it. Yeah. And so from our standpoint, what we need to be is more uh, boisterous talking to our investment companies about what they're investing in, looking at where the money is going. And because we are, in one sense, investors, having something to say about it. Thank you. Okay. Other favorite quotes, favorite moments from this section of the book? Um, hi, this is Denise. Go ahead, Denise. And um, I thought about the same quote and really um, – it's very frustrating for me when people don't take personal responsibility. Um, and so that's something that really resonated with me. And like I work in the benefit area. So um, it's, I realize how hard it is to take personal responsibility, especially what Dwight was just talking about with regard to benefits, um, like to your retirement or whatever, uh, because it takes time. It takes a lot of time to take responsibility. And, and that's, a, that's something that people don't necessarily want to give up. 
Um, they just want to move forward, get on with their life, not worry about these other things that maybe they don't think they um, can influence, but many times they can influence them and they need to take the time. Thank you. So maybe, maybe being responsible is not quick and easy sometimes. It's not always convenient. Uh, who else has got some thoughts on favorite moments? Um, this, uh, hi, this is Susan Doherty. Um, Go ahead. Kind of dovetailing to that same quote on page 290 is a quote that says, we must show them that the greatest force on earth is not the government, not the cor corporations, and not the military. The greatest force on earth is the love of people for each other. And I, I like this quote. I, I agree with this quote that it is love of people for each other, but I think it's really the force of people in general, whether it's out of love or, 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 or you know, monetary power or, you know, suggestion of time like Denise suggested or whatever. I, I think that there are people that fear corporations or fear the military, and the truth is, is it's really the people that hold the power, and I liked that quote for that reason. Great, thanks. Harriet, I see you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Gotcha. Great. Um, I think it's somewhat similar. I'm on page 332, um, kind of toward the end of the trial, and um, Charlie and Zadie are, are talking, and he uh, tells her that he understood from that woman's song that not one effort toward love is ever lost in the records of the universe. It goes on imprinting into the hearts of total strangers. And then at the end of that uh, paragraph, she says, in, in, this, in this moment, she finished, we've already won. Mm. Just, just the sense of not giving away the, the power to make something win, win or lose to some outside authority, the, to take back the power to do something positive, which is already winning. Mm -hmm. And you're also mentioning the, the small things that add up, the things that have happened in the past that are, that are not forgotten, that, that contribute to this, this change or this growth. Yeah, I, I, I think it's part of people being able to feel like they can take some responsibility to realize that you don't have to do something large and grand to, be, to have responsibility. You can do something small. Great. Thank you. Eloise, I saw you had your hand up. Do you got? What are you thinking about? Yes, uh, I'm on chapter 29. The trial. Speak up a little bit, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, just try to be a little louder. Okay, so I'm on chapter 29 of uh, the trial, and that's page 316. And I think uh, it was when Sandy was being questioned by the judge, and it starts with it says, "Well, some say we resist tyranny in the government." economic injustice, and environmental destruction. But I maintain that such views are a flawed conception of reality. In truth, we resist nothing. Tenzin asks for clarification. The Dandelion Insurrection stands for life, love, civil liberties, participatory democracy, economic equality, and environmental sanity. Is that the answer? When this movement is framed as oppositional, the proactive, left-supporting experts of the Dandelion insurrection are ignored. In truth, it is a handful of greedy, corporate elitists who are resisting the rest of humanity. They're doing a heck of a job, but they're not going to win. Left wants to leave, she pointed out. In fact, that those destructive few should be very grateful or since our will to live is keeping it alive, too. I'm not expecting a Congressional Medal of Honor, but if anyone can get them to stop attacking me, I'd be most grateful. And, and I mean, I think it just kind of, you know, speak to the whole reason why the Dandelion insurrection was kind of, you know, formed. And then if you look at it with the social reality of life today, you can see exactly what it's saying that as long as you try to stand up for social ills in society, the few that control, you know, the weft, they labor you, they kind of 
label you as being oppositional just so people can think that okay you're not doing the right thing you don't care for them when in reality those are the few people that want to control the web and have you control and labor so i think that uh, this really resonated with me because it's not only in you know one location of the world that it happens you see it happening all around the world where and then unfortunately what happens too is that as we see people standing up for social justice for others unfortunately most of them get consumed with the field so you will look at today and say why people have been fighting for time in the for this gross inequality to change but then you find out that some of the people that have been advocates they get into the system and then they turn against the entire system that we're fighting against so it's a two with uh, two or uh, so uh, yeah to us so that we got to really be critical when we're looking at, you know, fighting for social justice. And so how, how things get framed matters and whether we can frame ourselves as oppositional or creating and life affirming, all this matters. So, okay, thank you so much. Um, do we have other quotes that people want to share? Bill? Yep. This is Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Um, Good to have you. I, thank you. I do not have my book. It's in the front seat of my car. Okay, go. you can go by memory. Okay. It's not a quote, but it was a moment. Yeah. And you're asking for moments also. Yep. And it was actually in the beginning of the trial when Charlie was being charged and he was standing before the judge. And he, the judge called him Mr. Ryder. And Charlie said to the judge, um, call me Charlie. Mm. And he said that man to man, you know, we're going to be talking about my actions and so on. And we're going to get each other, get to know each other really well. And then he reached out his hand to shake hands with the judge. And there was a very large pregnant pause in the entire room when this happened. And I particularly like this, um, this moment for several reasons. One, it personalized the judge and the relationship that the two would have, and it acknowledged that Charlie saw him as a human being and tried to make connections. And that is one of the tenets of the Dandelion insurrection is be connected. Yeah, I think so that- he yeah. would re uh, Go ahead. I, I love the example. I think it, it calls attention to how formal and distant the court systems are. I know like for instance, Shahar, who's been trained to be a lawyer, she probably would, would Blanche at the idea of reaching across to shake the judge's hand. That just isn't the, the etiquette of the space. Right? Mm -hmm. So, but the other reason it matters. The other reason I like to this quote is because it talks of equality. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that my book is in my car is that I'm helping cleaning a Quaker meeting house in downtown Detroit. Uh -huh. And we are in the middle of a very blighted section. And equality is a tenet of Quaker principles. It's one of the things we teach our children. It's one of the things we talk about in meeting. And this was a moment of equality. It wasn't a superiority or um, being lower than, which is one of the problems with the justice system. Yep. I love it. I think Quaker, they were looking at each other as equals. Thank you so much. Okay, why don't we move on? I've got a few uh, quotes here as well. Um, I want to make sure we have some time to hear from Rivera. Uh, I like this, this quote about the idea of the dandelion as a symbol for this movement. Do you know why the dandelion is invincible, Tucker asked? Even when it's about to topple over, it doesn't give up. It offers a promise to every man, woman, and child. 
Make a wish, the dandelion says. Tucker said, quoting one of Charlie's articles, and this lowly weed will do its best to carry your seed-born hope to fertile ground. This idea of imagery that, that, is, uh, that makes sense for people, is organic, and, and kind of carries a, a vision forward. Uh, another is this idea that you've already mentioned about the, the people who've come before. Uh, this is where Tansy comes in and she notices this wall of uh, people who've died or who've, who've uh, been involved in the movement that's this real struggle. And she's looking at this kind of um, altar of pictures and, and quotes. She inspected the images of friends and fellow activists who had disappeared, died, or been incarcerated. She touched the photos of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and other heroes of the nonviolent lineage. Then she rummaged in her briefcase and pulled out a photo of Jesus. Y'all can put him up there, too. The Quakers read the Bible the way Jesus intended, shared it with Tolstoy, who inspired Gandhi, who set the stage for Dr. King. We got a tradition, and we all got to learn it, study it, and walk it in all our days. So she's talking about the kind of the spiritual and intellectual traditions uh, that include uh, uh, different religious groups that have you know, kind of made their case for why nonviolence is the honorable, honorable way to be. Uh, another uh, idea here is the importance of external observers, people from the global community who can be watching and, and be involved. Um, Belair was warned several times that his grandson had it coming. Tansy considered assassination to be a real likely option. Before you all get internationally, before you all got internationally famous, it would have been a simple murder. But now that you've inspired half the country to start standing up for the Bill of Rights, the world is watching and knocking you out counts as assassination. The breakdown of justice in the United States of America was no joke. With the military budget equivalent to the rest of the world's nations combined, the tenuous state of the Constitution had international officials nervous. This idea that uh, outside witnesses can make a big difference. I know in, in South Africa, when they were working toward the end of apartheid, the international community had a lot to say. There were boycotts, there were statements, uh, there were um, you know, lots of ways that the external community uh, made a difference for the safety of people in the struggle. Similarly, Witness for Peace and other groups that will join uh, human rights activists in parts of the world that are dangerous uh, and their outside presence as, a, as an international visitor uh, gives safety because the, if an international person is killed, it makes news in a way that somebody locally wouldn't. So this idea of international uh, uh, witness is important. Uh, public marches, visible signs of support. Uh, this quote, if we don't stand up for Charlie and Zadie's rights, Ellen Berg declared, the rights of every human being on this planet will vanish. Your last name may be Jones or Smith, but we're all Grey Riders now. The name stuck. The march of the Grey Riders swelled in volume. The suburban renaissance opened their doors and laid out blankets on the floor. Along the routes, children placed bouquets on front, front stoops and hung chain-linked wreaths on their doorknobs, sending the message, dandelions grow here sanctuary within. As the march swept past their homes, many followed the example of Lupe Hernandez Booker and joined in. This idea that there are visible signs of support that might be a, a color or a, a flag or a, an umbrella or some kind of an image that says we're with you, uh, kind of a, a silence standing together as well as the notion of sanctuary are all, all evident here. Uh, safety in numbers. Uh, they're marching to Washington, Charlie exclaimed. Everyone, Tucker confirmed. The entire Dandelion's insurrection is marching to Washington to demand justice for you and Zadie. From the north, south, and west, a great migration of people assembled. No one knew where, but rumors claimed that Charlie and Zadie were walking to their trial, protected by the bodies of the people. Every woman bragged that she had marched alongside Charlie Ryder, and every man swore as Eddie Bird Gray had smiled at him. We talked about this last week, the idea of safety in numbers and about the importance of kind of uh, uh, working together. Uh, I'm racing through these a little bit because I want to have some time for conversation. I apologize. Uh, th this quote I have is, uh, 
connecting with security forces, I think is the theme here. It kind of goes to where Pam was talking about connecting with the judge. Uh, the gray riders stood in place as Ernest Hernandez sl walked slowly forward and spoke to the soldiers. We are not your enemy. We are your people. These are our streets, your streets, our children's streets. Let us pass by. The soldiers stood unmoving. They had orders. The troops raised their guns. Look into their eyes, Inez cried. Look into their eyes and see love. No one knew whether she spoke to soldiers or citizens. The two front lines tensed. Activists and soldiers each had their training, as different as night and day. This importance of connecting and humanizing. Okay, so, uh, Rivera, you've been here, and people have been finding lots of interesting quotes in your, in your writing. Um, I wondered if we could maybe entertain some questions for you from the group, and uh, then maybe talk about some of the things. I have a few questions if nobody else does, but I'm, I'm going to open the floor now. Are, are, you, are you able to answer some questions? Yeah, definitely. All right. So who's got a question for our guest? I can, I can start off. Um, could you tell us about the, the study guide? Uh, we have a, um, the students in the class got a copy of the study guide. How is that study guide being used? Why did you develop it? What are some ways that it might, uh, you might see that out in the world? Yeah, so um, I used a, a wide variety of research sources for actually writing the plot of the dandelion instruction. And in the process of doing that, I had the opportunity to learn quite a bit about nonviolent struggle and nonviolent movements um, from a very strategy and in-depth perspective that I hadn't gotten as a citizen activist at that point. And so people started writing to me asking, how do we make the dandelion instruction real? And I used to send out a one-page sheet of all the references they could go and read. <laughs> uh, and someone said, "Can what about a discussion guide for our book group? So I started to write a discussion guide that merged with some of the tools of nonviolent struggle that I had learned along the way. And that kind of grew into this study guide, uh, which is now being used. It's being used... Uh, in different places around the country, the, some church groups are using it, some book groups are using it, and some universities are using it too, which is very exciting, very interesting to hear back from those professors and students, like you guys actually, yeah. who are, are going through the process. And then I also did an online um, Zoom webinar going through the study guide with people who didn't have a community to connect with in their area. And so we did it together, uh, kind of like this, but we actually went through the study guide from start to finish. Yeah, yeah, I've been just kind of picking little pieces of it for now, but there's, there's lots of good stuff in there. I saw Dwight had a question. Dwight, do you want to go ahead? You have to unmute yourself, or I could do it for you. Got it. Yes, uh, Rivera, I have a question. And this gets more into, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but how much of your personal life do we read into this story and what led you to write this the story itself? So there's, um, at the time of writing the book, there wasn't actually a lot of my personal life in it. Since writing the book, it's ironic, but there's many elements of it that now are much more a part of my life. Like I'm much more involved in social justice movements than I was before writing the novel. Um, people always ask me, who are you in the book? And uh, the truth is I am both Charlie and Zadie. I took kind of my introverted self, writer self, and my extroverted, you know, I'll get out there and talk for an hour self and put them in two characters. So that was a very fun experiment. Um, and besides that, there's, there's not a lot of my life. Uh, some of the things from the St. John Valley uh, are directly from my experience and then some of the things around local food and gardening come very much out of my family's history at being part of the local and organic food movement in Maine and understanding the real power and potential of transformation that happens when people have um, 
connection to their food and the self-reliance that comes from a community-based food system. What inspired me to write the book was I had already write, written my first novel, and at the end of the first novel, there's kind of a big social justice moment um, with a big demonstration in the streets. But I, that left me hungry for more. It was a rather implausible moment strategically, like kind of one of those miracles that occur in the courses of novels, which as novelists we have the privilege of doing. Um, but it left me a little curious to understand a little bit more about how these things actually happen and to actually write a story that had all of the fun and the adventure of our great epics. You know, like everybody loves Star Wars, but it's rooted in violence. Um, so I wanted to know how to do that, use all the hero's journey, the personal transformation, the adventure, the danger, the sense of purpose and meaning, the friendships, the connections, the hero's quest sort of feeling, but in the context of nonviolent struggle which is another arena that can also provide us all of those deep mythic themes that we're seeking as human beings. I can see, I see Denise has a question. Go ahead, Denise. Um, yes, I just wondered if there was a reason that you uh, made your two, I'll call them heroes, um, be in their early 20s versus older. That's a great question. Um, so in the new novel, Billionaire Buddha, the hero and heroine are both in their late 40s, early 50s. Um, so that's just a note that these are conscious choices and they, they speak to really different people. I chose Charlie and Zadie because what they, to be in their 20s because what they did is, was actually quite impetuous. It was actually not terribly well reasoned when they began it. And that is something that young people in their 20s tend to do. They have a lot of energy, they have a lot of enthusiasm, they tend to charge into projects, and they tend to get themselves into slightly disastrous situations. So I chose to do that, and there's a few other elements too. Um, I wanted to really shake up people's minds and consciousness around one particular theme. Well, there's a lot in the Dandelion instruction, but the one big one I was working on was to switch from the hero succeeds through violence to the hero succeeds through nonviolent action. Um, and so I kept a lot of the other classic models of storytelling that are in place in kind of the, the larger cultural memes. So we do have two heroes, and a hero and a heroine in their 20s. It is a heterosexual relationship. Uh, they are white. I'll just say that right up front. They are white. And they come from uh working class backgrounds working to middle class backgrounds so you know i i was some of that i was fairly intentional about at the beginning some of that i kind of emerged into intentionality about it as the writing went on and some of it i have seen as themes uh, as it's been out and circulating people have asked me about these kinds of questions uh, but yeah, I, I really was quite specific that I was going to use a couple of young people as the central protagonists of this novel. Um, we'll because have to read I'm your next also one. engaging with um, other young people as well. I see Craig has a comment. Go ahead, Craig. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, just this last Monday, there was an incident at the Capitol or quite a number of people were arrested. Still going on. Yeah, and um, what it came up for me immediately since I've been you know, reading the book uh, and thinking about some of the events was a question, uh, Rivera, for, I guess I'm curious as your perspective, having you now a number of years after having written the book and then when you look out uh, on the political, environmental, government um, scenario, particularly this year in elections, um, what thoughts or comments might you have in terms of uh, the positions you are taking in the book? Um, Maybe that's not a fair question. I guess I was just looking for, for your perception of how things are showing up in our country at this time in contrast to the events you uh, portrayed in the book. Okay, that's a, a simpler question to respond to. The other one's a really good question to have to reflect on it. But so 
the things I was writing about in the Dandelion Insurrection, all of the problems in society existed at the time of writing in smaller forms. So I was taking seeds of things that existed and blowing them up into their logical courses of application. Certain laws that are on the books, um, you know, are just sitting there quietly on our laws and our records. Um, and so I just expanded them to what those laws are going to feel like when our government's school structure actually starts to enforce them. These laws are still on the books. I don't think there's any of them that I was writing about that have actually been changed. Um, there is also a rising at this point, a rising participation in the nonviolent movements for change in the United States. So while we don't have one central movement like the Dandelion Insurrection, we do have um, an upswell in participation in the multi-stranded, what I like to call movement of movements that's going on. Uh, and that's very engaging. It's becoming more common for people to either be involved in movements or to know someone who's involved in movements. There's also anti-fracking and, and concern about energy is a big area right now. Yeah, yeah. So people are more conscious about that. Uh, midway through writing the novel, uh, after I had already laid out the whole mass surveillance uh, situation that was going on in the novel, Snowden came along and made his revelations about the NSA. That was a very freaky moment for me, honestly. I felt a little prophetic and a little unhappy about what I was seeing, but it was kind of validating about what I suspected was going on. Um, and gosh, I could go on on this subject for a while. There's a lot going on, lots of really hopeful things um, and the lots of connecting the dots, connections to one another, connections to how our issues interrelate um, and a sense that, it is not unreasonable to be asking for the things that we're asking for as citizens. It's actually absolutely vital for our continuation on planet Earth and the health and survival of our families and community members. Oh, I want to bring up this. Uh, Craig mentioned the events in, in Washington. Uh, thank you, Rivera. I, uh, Democracy Spring is the hashtag that's being used, but it's a, it's a movement that has been they're concerned about big money uh, in politics and the inability for individual people to have much influence when uh, the way that the laws are set up for corporate donations. So you can see in the upper left here, there's a, uh, they had a time and they marched from Philadelphia to DC, uh, picking up people along the way, giving speeches. And then they had a, a series of uh, uh, citizen, citizen sit-ins at the Capitol where they are having different sections of the movement. They had a senior day, senior citizens' rights, a union day, uh, a student day, an environmental day. So today is the Climate Justice Day. And my understanding is that there've been, uh, they've been parceling them out, but there've been a thousand people arrested so far, been ticketed for breaking the law and standing up for their rights. Uh, and uh, it's continuing. And uh, yesterday, uh, if I go forward one more, uh, uh, they had a, a woman that was dressed as a uh, the Statue of Liberty, and they had this photograph they took of her being cuffed and, and arrested that has now become kind of a memeable thing where they've, uh, this is the picture of her, they've kind of dimmed the background and put her in a blue to stand out. And uh, I, the bottom image here shows uh, they've been doing trainings, the idea of preparation before action. The idea of discipline is required for nonviolent action. Uh, the, this morning there was a tweet showing a picture of people at a church. If you were to click on the picture, you'd see it blow up into a, a hassle line. People are learning about somebody on the other side is hassling you and you're trying to not overreact. Um, but the idea is that they've learned from all these previous movements that there's, this, there's things that you do that ensure discipline, ensure creativity, ensure a shared uh, framing of the issues. And uh, um, so I think it's really kind of exciting that they're using a lot of the things that are in your book, Rivera. You were saying that, you know, you're not prophetic, but but uh, there are these things that are, people are gathering and using to give the people a voice. So I think that's, that's quite exciting. Um, I wanted to 
Rivera ask you if you could talk a little bit about the idea of movements, campaigns, and actions. So one of the themes that came up as I was researching for the dandelion instruction and looking around at what was going on in the movements themselves was the difference between doing single actions, one-up actions, and actually strategizing a whole movement for change. So there's a framework that was taught to me by Reverend James Lawson, who's called the arch one of the architects of the civil rights movement. And this is the framework that you very nicely have put into this slide. <laughs> so the idea is that actions, a series of actions, uh, hopefully well-designed, coordinated actions, makes up a campaign. And a series of campaigns hopefully builds on, it, on each other to create the stepping stones of a pathway to achieving the goals of a, the arc of a whole movement. In the civil rights movement, for example, we had numerous campaigns and they were really designed as campaigns. So the Montgomery bus boycott, there were actually a number of um, the bus desegregation and riding campaigns that preceded the Montgomery bus boycott. Another really good example of the campaign building was in Nashville uh, when they did the sitting campaigns and the downtown lunch counters and were successful in a six month time period, they turned around and did another campaign in Nashville the next uh, year to desegregate the next string of shops and movie theaters because only the downtown desegregated. They also launched parallel um, sitting campaigns in I think six to 12 different cities the following year. So these are really clear examples of cumulative campaigns building one on top of the other, um, using the success of one and the strategies learned through one as the framework for preparing the next steps. So I feel like this is actually one of the, the biggest teachings that I get to bring around when I go and give workshops, is getting most of us who have been just called to do actions one right after another, to have a little strategic framework of how we can actually, in our group, and if we're ever thinking about making change, use some of the tools that have been well, well explored and understood over the thousands of years of nonviolent history to actually be much wiser in what we're doing and much more um, aware and strategized around what we're doing. So if you were to take the Democracy Spring movement, uh, they, their movement might be uh, to get money out of politics and to one person, one vote sort of a idea. Yeah, so Democracy Spring actually qualifies as a campaign. And within okay. that campaign, they have the march, they have these days of sit-ins and civil disobedience. Um, you know, there's a coalition that's organizing Democracy Spring, but one of the groups that's very much involved is 99 Rise. 99 Rise has done a series of com campaigns over the past, uh, wow, I guess it's like three to five years now, including a similar campaign in uh, California for very similar goals where they marched to to Sacramento, they sat in and occupied a, a Capitol building and they did civil disobedience at the end. So that was their California campaign and now this is a national campaign that they're doing. So uh, particular actions would be uh, the sit-in itself. Uh, you'd have all kinds of logistics about you know, medical care for people who might get hurt and what buses or whatever you're needing, very specific actions planned in great detail where a campaign is more of a, you know, over a, a shorter period of time, but a, but a, a vision for kind of a, a accumulating of different actions into something that's impactful. What, what makes a movement? Well, a movement generally is a little bit longer in scope of time, and it's broader in its goals and aims. So a movement's goal may be equality for people of all color, or it may be to um, create a vibrant and respectful democracy, whereas a single campaign or a, sing or a series of campaigns even may be focused on the more tangible goal 
of getting money out of politics um, or creating, uh, breaking the two-party system and opening it up for more parties. Um, and then within that, your actions might each have very specific, even smaller goals, like swaying an elected official to your side or creating an obstructive uh, moment, a disruptive moment where they actually, the Congress actually cannot function unless they address this concern. So yeah. each level of actions, campaigns, and movements have a different scope. It's kind of like a periscope of focus and attention, goal and, in, and intention. I saw and a lot of knowledge is in your study guides if this is like very fast and you want to go yeah. back. Yeah. yeah, page 27 is where you get started on that. I saw today that Rosaria Dawson the actress who's gotten kind of quite well known was arrested and they used her celebrity status quite well to kind of let people know that people care and this matters. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the idea of um, people do nonviolence for different reasons. Some of us like Pam, for instance, as a Quaker has a spiritual uh, foundation for her work, or maybe if you're a Buddhist or if you have a, uh, a background that, that calls you to uh, be nonviolent, but there are different um, ways that people interact. I know, Rivera, you're going to have to go soon, aren't you? You're getting ready to... I am. Unfortunately, the other workshop is at 9.30, and so I, I need to actually get go. So I'm wondering if there are any other quick comments or questions from the people on the call that need sure. to be addressed. Sure. Because you're very knowledgeable. I don't know if you're... you're students know that you're quite knowledgeable in nonviolent action and struggle. Yeah. Uh, I, I was telling Rivera, I was an intern at the Resource Center for Nonviolence back in Santa Cruz years ago. And so I was thrilled when I heard she was in Santa Cruz at a coffee shop right near there, or a library near there. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments for Rivera before she, she heads out to her next adventure? I'm looking on the list of folks to see if we've got any closing questions or comments. Dwight has a comment. Go ahead, Dwight. Mine is a very brief comment, but what it means, what I got out of the book was some, some really good, strong pieces of, that helped me to think more about what I'm doing and not doing. And I really, really appreciate the book, and, I, and I've talked about it with other people as well. Great job. This is Susan Doherty. Um, one thing I, I have to say, and I know you have to go, so I'll keep it brief, but I just really appreciate how you incorporated religion without excluding different religions, that you were able to highlight the commonality among the religions and, and the motivations of all of them and, and how they're really a source of peace and love and nonviolence. And I, I just thought that was an incredible um, way that I thought it was incredible the way that you just tied them all together in a common goal and mission. And I, being a religious person, truly appreciate that. So that was a very good um, part of the book for me. Thanks, Susan. Anybody else? Boy, I'm really pleased to have you with us, Rivera. It was a, a thrill to be able to connect. And, to, uh, you know, the magic of you being available at the time of our meeting is another one of those little miracles. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, um, I would send our regards from Detroit to your, your group in, in California. Let them know we're thinking good thoughts for them as they do their dandelion springboard uh, for change. Well, and thank you, you for hosting this course and for you guys for engaging so much with the, the questions and the content and exploring it so deeply. It's really invigorating for me to drop into to this conversation and to get to see some of the, the conversation you've had on other sessions. It's just amazing. And thank you so much. And I'm so grateful that you're in Detroit reading this book because Detroit is very much on my mind in these times and you, you're all so wonderful so thank you so much and thanks for letting me join you today all right take care okay bye
Okay. Uh, really great to have uh, uh, the author talk about some of her thoughts as she was organizing and, and writing the book. Apparently, writing a novel is not something you just throw off, you know, there's some planning involved, some strategy as to, to connecting. I don't know about the rest of you, but I found myself moved emotionally by some of the elements of the story where it felt like uh, it was kind of speaking to me in a way where sticking up for the little guy, you know, and for, for uh, all of that seems like something that uh, touches us as humans. Um, I'm just going to finish this, this slide and then I want to go to some of your, uh, I'll tell you about where we're headed next and then uh, get some of your closing thoughts. Um, this idea of pragmatic versus ideological forms of nonviolence, uh, Gene Sharp did this work on the 198 methods of nonviolent action, and he was very much a pragmatist. He was saying that people use, we're committed to nonviolence not because it's an ethical requirement, but because it's the most effective strategy. More people can be involved. You don't have to be, have big weapons to do it. Uh, there are different ways to participate, so different ages and, and cultures and, and groups can be, be involved, so it's more effective. Whereas other people say, nonviolence matters because of my ideology or because of my spiritual life. It's ethically the best thing to do. Uh, Gandhi talked about it not harming your opponent. What if you're wrong in your campaign? What if your ideas turn out to be wrong-headed and you're doing the wrong thing? If you've killed somebody or maimed somebody or hurt somebody in your, in your drive for that, you're going to regret it. So nonviolence says us, we're always going to not harm the opponent because we, you know, we want to all be part of the human community. So it's ethically best. Uh, in terms of means and ends, prag pragmatists in nonviolence would say that you can separate them. You can use kind of nasty or embarrassing or humiliating means if it's a good end you're working toward. Whereas these ideological, spiritual nonviolent activists say you can't separate the means from the ends. They're, they're one and the same. If you're not using love to get where you're going, then you, you have a problem. If your end goal is a loving society, a loving community, and you don't use love to get there, you've got problems. So they're, they're indivisible. You can't separate the two. In terms of the approach to conflict, uh, pragmatists would say that we have incompatible interests and the only way people are going to change is if we force them through pressure, lots of different kinds of pressure, nonviolent action, whereas the ideological folks focusing on nonviolence tend to think of shared interests, looking for the shared humanity, the shared connections, and they're working harder at kind of bringing us under a shared umbrella of, of community where we're all part of the, the same team eventually. Uh, and uh, in terms of the opponent, uh, the pragmatists would say it's a very competitive relationship that we have to out strategize them and out, out maneuver them. Whereas the ideological folks would say we want it to be a cooperative movement. We want to frame things as a cooperative process where we want to bring you to our side and we would like to all cooperate toward this goal. Um, and so there's different framings that go on. I wanted to point out the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, this Nonviolence International, uh, they did a book on, it's an online book on what is nonviolence. It's a really nice introduction to nonviolence in terms of some of the theoretical pieces of it, and it's, it's short and, and useful if it's something that interests you. So uh, I don't want to run too long tonight. I mentioned the, uh, today, sorry, uh, the Democracy Spring, and I mentioned that we saw this slide. But where we're going next, um, is uh, we're gonna we're done with the book. So some of you uh, uh, have been with us through three sessions. Some of you are just getting connected. Uh, next week we're gonna kind of go pretty quickly to Wednesday night. Uh, we've been doing Wednesdays and we had a special Saturday to bring in Rivera. But we're going to be talking about the idea of applying nonviolent campaign concepts in our own world of conflict resolution practice. So I picked a couple of short readings and I'm going to share with you by email. Uh, one is called Defense on the Streets, Stepping into Conflict by one of my mentors, George Lakey, a Quaker trainer. And it looks at like using nonviolence in your neighborhood. Um, the second piece is Speaking from the Heart, an Introduction to Nonviolent Communication, which is a whole set of ideas about nonviolence. What would it look like in our interpersonal, immediate interactions with others? So many of you have heard of nonviolent communication. I want to kind of bring that up. So this is a nice handout that introduces some of the key ideas of, of nonviolent communication. In the last piece, uh, students in our class have read 
Bernie Mayer's Beyond Neutrality. And this uh, review of the book by Chip House, Chip was with a group called Search for Common Ground that did a lot of work internationally. Chip is a political scientist. Uh, Bernie Mayer is more of a social family therapy, social work person. And uh, so Chip's review brings some, some to highlight some of the importance of mediators being willing to step beyond neutrality and take a stand, oh. get involved in action. So yeah. these three pieces will give us enough gist to get started in a conversation. I'll be bringing more, more ideas into it, but I'm really hoping you'll, you'll come back and, and join us again on Wednesday night as we dig a little deeper. So what I want to do as a closing closeout is I want to go down the line with folks and ask you to, to uh, say a word or two about ways where people power is evident in your own life, places where you see the power of cooperation or the power of love or connection or fearlessness being evident in your own life. And I'm going to go, go down the line. It looks like um, maybe I should start. Uh, let's see. Two four eight three four six three six six three. Who would that be? Okay. How about five eight six two one nine two three three five? Chicken. This morning. Chicken. I, I hear you, Dwight. Hi. Oh, this is Susan. Did you want me to speak? Go ahead, Susan. People power. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I, I've seen um, just recently in my own life is um, I've been uh, active in the past in the community mental health um, uh, community in Macomb County and um, some of the laws and uh, changes at the state level that uh, might be coming down the pike and and how it is that we are going to um, deal with that and making sure that there's justice for people with mental illness and development, developmental disabilities and, and how those people are organizing and, and protesting and contacting their legislators and, and, and really being activists in a nonviolent way. And um, I just see that in, in that group community, which is really not organized other than anything by, you know, the needs of their loved ones and, and the passion that they have for, for those in need. So I, I see that happening in everyday life, and I think some of the things that I learned in this class and from the book will be helpful in that effort. Thanks, Susan. I see an 847 phone number, 563-565-3399. Check in and where you Hi, Bill. It's Pam. Hi, Pam. Um, for me, unviolence is kind of embracing a way of life, and I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but it's a big part of something I'm looking at. So you're aware of people power in your own life, especially as it relates to nonviolence. Yes, and I also believe that we are ripples in a pond, and that which we embody influences and inspires others. So that's an important piece of it all. Thank you. Good luck with your cleaning work. <coughs> okay, so who would be Karjak Kim? Kajak Kim. I'm not sure who that is. I'm unmuting. Maybe I should go with names that are obvious. Uh, Craig, could you, uh, people power is evident in your own life when? Okay, um, yeah, sure, certainly. Uh, in terms of uh, locally here in the Rochester area, I've been directly and indirectly involved with uh, an activity called Don't Drill the Hills. It has to do with um, uh, just that, uh, our area being potential for uh, drilling of gas and oil exploration. And even in today in the local um, paper that we get for the Rochester area, it's the third time now that in the, the headline, City Wins Over Don't Drill the Hills. Mm. A, th a third court case where, and 
two thoughts. One, when I read these articles, it's like, you got to be kidding me. They've missed the point here. The point originally was that our local area, Rochester Hills, voted um, to change the city ordinance, which allowed citizens to have a voice in use of public property. And the court cases uh, don't formally address that, all three of them, but rather say, well, there's no risk, there's no danger to gas and oil drilling. He said, wait a minute, you missed the point. The point originally was we had created an environment where we have a voice, and that voice uh, was it was not listened to by the city um, management and and the mayor. Now the mayor is um, one of my neighbors, <laughs> so okay. he and I have an understanding difference of perspective, uh, and, and that's okay. We're still and, and that's my point is that we disagree uh, about this topic, and we're neighbors and and we get together and share meals and all that good stuff too. So that to me is bringing that right to home in terms of walking the talk of nonviolence and embracing everybody, even if you disagree with them. In your local, near, nearby community. Yeah, right across the street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess that's, that gets it close for me in terms of, um, oh, so the other side of this is that I've been at several of meetings and I have to, maybe have to change how I speak my suggestion, because I don't think it's being heard, but basically this um, oil uh, and mineral rights uh, is an agreement individual homeowners make with the drilling company. And in this area, 400 people have just blanketly agreed. And so what I'm suggesting is that a campaign would be, or not a campaign, but an activity would be to um, get people to unagree. And if, if enough people unagree, then the Contracts would have to go away because they wouldn't have the have the agreements. But there's a whole bunch of legal stuff connected with that. But it, to me, it seems so simple. If you could get people to agree to make a change, that they could happen very quickly. But that's just not how yet the system works on this. So Great. those are the areas I'm involved. Thank you, Denise. I see you next on my list. Okay, I would just say um, people power is evident in my life when. Um, we result, we settle an agreement. So in my life, whenever we have a union management agreement and we come to a conclusion that we all agree on, um, that's, that's awesome. And that's where I see people power. Thank you. Dwight. Um, I have several things I want to mention. I will remain focused on working with school groups, uh, small circle groups uh, where we talk about different ways of approaching things and being heard. Schools, uh, I find with the whole zero tolerance piece, and what, whereas they may not call it zero tolerance, it functions very closely to zero tolerance, which to me is a real gray area near violence. You know, what we show students will misbehave that you do something wrong, we'll get even with you. Mm. And never and that what message that you get out of it? What have you learned from it? What are we trying to get you to understand? What are we we really all understanding from this? How does it hurt us? How does it hurt you? And so on. We just go after it and if you do that, this is what's going to happen to you. And that's no different than if you look at me wrong, I'm gonna punch you in the face. You know, it's similar pattern. Yeah, we really need to be working on that and that needs to be not only with the students but with staff as well, with parents as well. How we all very subtly let our young people know the way to get something accomplished is to overpower whoever we're up against. We want power with, not power over. Right. And that, and that's pretty much where I, I Wanted to keep my focus with my school groups. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, Eloise, have you got people power evident in your life? Sure, I do. And uh, fortunately for me, it's like a two of two cities, two countries. And the first one would be like in Detroit, living on Joy Road. 
I mean, you hear all the negative news of violence in Detroit, and you think that some of the neighborhoods you enter, you just see people going to be stuck, and there's no control, there's no structure. Unfortunately, until you live in some of these neighborhoods, you see that the people in the community, I mean, they have structure, they want peace, you know. They use that people power to connect with each other and prevent crimes from the community. Like where I live on Steel Hill, and they have a community black club where they have meeting every month and they do that in conjunction with the police. I was surprised the other day, leaving home, I had a call, because my neighbor had called, she thought someone was breaking into my home. And when I came home, I mean, about four police cars were in the yard. So, I mean, that just shows the power and the care that people are trying to reconnect. Then when you go outside, you know, for me, who you know, have this international travel, but places like Liberia, I mean, so many people that live in advanced world wouldn't understand or wouldn't be able to go through what most of the people I see go through. The gross of uh, uh, corruption, the gross misuse of the country funds. You have people that live on fit instead of dollar a day as this way, you know, notion that people live on a dollar a day. Some people don't have food and yet you see few people they they just luxurily and exorbitantly spending money and yet these people they have not resulted to violence just by their frustration and anger. They still have hope that one day they will be able to rise up. And then the most important thing there, they get together and use their power to be happy. And you will wonder, I mean why this person is being happy, why they carry fit in life and in tomorrow. But I think it's that togetherness, that love that is shared for themselves. When you see some of the deplorable conditions in life, and you would just expect to hear them complain every day for everything. But t I tell you, they talk to you with so much optimism of the features. So I, I think that's the people power I've seen, I've been evident in my life. Thank you, good examples. Harriet, can you check out with us? People power is evident in your life? Hi. Um, well, certainly in a, in a Quaker meeting and bringing people together, but I, I find just when a group of people is able to converse about things that uh, are more than superficial. I'm in a sustainability discussion group at the Green Garage, and, you know, I'm finding it especially meaningful when um, there's a guy who is a libertarian which I characterize as pretty far to the right, and my views are more on the left. And we're able to find some things we can agree on or, you know, really have productive discussions about. I, I think that that is pretty powerful. Thank you. So dialogue. Yeah. Uh, Tommy, do you want to check out? Yes, I do. Um, in my line of work, I deal with uh, cases of discrimination. And so what I see, and I'll be speaking on that on Monday. And what I see a lot of people doing is coming forward with complaints of discrimination, where a lot of times they used to be uh, fearful of retaliation. So I see that happening more, uh, and I think that's uh, powering. But also in the presidential elections that we're experiencing right now, I see a lot of young voters coming out to vote, which we didn't have that in the past, so I see that as well. People power, for sure. That's right. Great. Well, I. Uh, I thank you all for uh, a good participation. I think we're, we're, our numbers have dwindled as we've gotten close to the, the half hour. Um, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll stay with us and, and join us on Wednesday night for more interesting discussions about connecting nonviolence and nonviolent theory to dispute resolution and conflict resolution.